Good morning to you and welcome once again to our Sunday morning service. Uh, great to start off worshipping the Lord that way. And can I just say that this morning uh, we will be having communion together. Uh, I know normally we do this on a Thursday night on Zoom uh, and uh, everyone is welcome to that. Realise, of course, that uh, some people find it a bit difficult, but we're hoping in the next few weeks to uh, give a bit more teaching about how Zoom can be used to make it easier for people to get online. But uh, towards the end of this morning's service, we will take bread and wine together. So I don't know how you're watching this, but you might just want to pause or just get up and uh, get some bread and wine. A few other things to mention. We want to really praise God for what has been happening uh, in the life of Ray Cotter and his family. Pastor Ray Cotter as uh, many of you will know, has uh, done a sponsored walk that was originally supposed to be 50 miles. He's done 150 miles, and he has raised over £33,000. And this is going to be given uh, towards building a hospital in Zimbabwe, to uh, building five orphan homes in Malawi. And all of this is in honour of our beloved Pastor Edwin, uh, who is Ray's brother, of course. So we praise God for that, and we praise God for this great testimony as well to the life and ministry of Pastor Edwin. We also want to give God massive thanks as well, because Pastor Ray Cotter, his son, has been waiting for about six months to go into hospital uh, for a heart operation, what looked like a very serious heart operation that might take up to about six hours uh, and when they took him in last week, they uh, opened him up and said, there's nothing wrong. And he doesn't even need to be on any medication. So we praise God for his healing touch on the life of Timothy. Just to say that all the uh, parts, there's five parts on a series looking at the life of Peter. Birmingham City Church and other Elim Church have kindly shared this with us. And that's available online for people to use, either personally or particularly with their house groups. Just like to say one other thing, might seem a bit strange, that picture of flowers there. But one of the amazing things about uh, the Cornerstone Silverdale Elim Church has been its care and compassion for people who have been bereaved. Um, if we know of anyone who has been bereaved, letters and cards go out from the church. But one of the things that we have started doing and we would like to continue doing is uh, for those who have got some sort of link with the congregation or a member of the congregation, we've started sending flowers along to the funeral or cremation service. Uh, obviously, this does cost money, but we want to show God's love in a very practical way. But I just want to suggest something that uh, some churches, they have flower rotors, and I know people provide flowers or people pay for flowers. But I just like people just to consider whether or not they would like to contribute towards the cost of these flowers. What we do is we set the money aside. And it may be that there's a certain date of the year that is significant for you. And uh, you might like to just give money to the church, as I said, to go towards these flowers. Uh, for me, it's the end of February. My mother died on February the 29th. It was actually a leap year and she died on that particular day. So, I mean, every year at the end of uh, February, but particularly in those leap years, that is a very poignant time uh, for me. So just something to share for people to consider. Just want to mention as well that when this service is over, or it depends when you're watching it, uh, but between 12.15 and 12.45, we just invite those who can to come on Zoom and just to share a coffee, you know, bring your own coffee along. And we just have a chat just as we would if we were back in the uh, normal church building. But it's just a time for fellowship. So I would encourage people to come along. Really enjoyed it last week. We're going to continue our worship in a minute, and then a little bit later, Pastor Steve Kerry is going to share with us. It's actually a message that he shared with us back on a, a communion service uh, a few Thursdays ago. And strangely enough, for some reason, that I had uh, recorded this. I, I hadn't even actually remembered that uh, I'd set this to record. But it talks about gazing at God, look at God, looking into God's face. And I found it incredibly inspiring. 
Uh, and so I've asked Steve if uh, that's okay for us to repeat that. I know there are a few people here that will have heard it, but uh, I find this a very challenging, a very encouraging message and a very powerful message. So um, Steve will be reading from Revelation 4. We're actually going to have that reading beforehand, just so that people can uh, think on this incredible vision that John has when he's caught up into heaven and sees God city, seated on the throne. So let me just pray and we will continue with our worship. Our Father God, we thank you that uh, you are seated on the throne. We thank you that your right hand is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. We thank you that you have also sent your spirit into our lives and into our world. And Father, we pray that we will really have communion with you this morning, Father, Son and Spirit, that we will be able to gaze at you and realize more of your love, more of your power, more of this great salvation that you have given us, more of what you want us to do in our lives, or more particularly of what you want to do in us through your spirit. And may, Lord, we just become come closer to you, looking into your face, uh, seeing all your love, seeing all your power, as I said. Please, God, meet with us, challenge us, and encourage us this morning. For we pray this in the name of your Son, our Saviour. Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Jesus, the light in the darkness. Jesus, the lamp to our feet. No chasm so vast. No mountain too steep, Jesus the land to our feet. Jesus the light in the darkness, Jesus the land to our feet. No chasm so vast, no mountain too steep, Jesus the land to our feet. Revelation 4 After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne seven lamps were blazing. 
These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.
great way to link to what I want to share today, to sing a song that he is Lord over all. Uh, I get increasingly concerned with the way the world is responding to the crisis, the global pandemic we're in, but also more importantly, the way the church is often responding to it. With all sorts of daft ideas and uh, distracted ideas. I, I call some of them distract, you know, conspiracy distraction, all this other stuff. And they need to keep Jesus right at the center. If we keep Jesus at the center, like a wheel that has a hub at the center, there'll be stability, there'll be motion, movement, there'll be wholeness, we'll be living according to design. I'm going to talk about that in our lives later on when I've had a reading, but I think the way some people talk, they think other people are on the throne of heaven. Well, Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is Lord. None of this took him by surprise. Um, he is perfectly working still for his divine purposes to be fulfilled on the earth and uh, I believe that we're coming into the greatest days the church has had since the early church I believe and perhaps in ways that will eclipse the Wesleyan revival at this juncture in a global pandemic we think well how could that be so but I see with the eyes of faith things that God has shown me a few years from now by his spirit that are coming on our land in the UK and I want to come and give you hope today and say to you that Jesus is going to have his way in our nation in a wonderful way. Whatever people are putting on their social media feeds or whatever you listen to, the Lord is going to do great things, probably in many of our lifetimes, I believe. And that's because Jesus is on the throne. He's Lord of all. Let's look at that throne room and reacquaint ourselves with heaven. I want to look at a window in heaven. You know, the word revelation is unveiling in the Greek. It's this sense of opening up a window into heavenly quarters and to supernatural invisible realm and all the things God is doing and has done and will do. Let's have a look at Revelation 4 verses 1 to 11. It says, After this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. <clears throat> Once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightnings, rumblings and peals of thunder in front of the throne seven lamps were blazing these are the seven spirits of God also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal in the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and in back the first living creature was like a lion the second was like an ox the third had the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, I love this bit, day and night they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. I think... A good God gaze fixes a lot, fixes a lot in our emotions. We become like what we behold. Whatever we fascinate upon or gaze upon, we become like. It says that in 2 Corinthians, we behold in the glory of the Lord a change from one degree of glory to the next. If you focus on the negativity, sometimes the media spin, there's no finger pointing going on there that's around in this world, the fear over faith mentality that's been put out there in a world without Christ, it will affect your emotionality and your heart will fall. If you focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and his greatness and his goodness and his kindness and his love and his mercy, 
if you look into the eyes of Jesus, your emotions will soar. You will be in this kind of pre-heaven bliss that we were created for when God designed people. You were made to enjoy the Lord and you were created for his, his pleasure. The Bible, that's in the Westminster Confession, isn't it? The chief end of man's about enjoying God and worshipping and loving him forever. And so we enjoy the Lord, but actually the Bible says everything was made by God and for God in Colossians. Why was it made by God and for God, ourselves included? Ephesians answers us, because we were created to the praise of his glory. And this is where I think the church of Jesus Christ often goes off the rails in all sorts of different ways. And in the landscape we're in now, it's gone off sometimes into strange reflections on politics in, in a negative sense, criticism. Um, I don't mind political saber rattling, but there's all sorts of obsessive stuff out there with people with sometimes more time in the strangest of seasons. And God would have us put our eyes back on the one who sits on the throne. Because when that happens, everything starts to settle into divine order. There was a, there was a, um, a principal of a Bible college called Steve Brady, I believe he's still there, at Moreland's. Friend of mine, Greg Hassam's good, good friends with him. And he, Steve, Steve Brady said, anything that's not Christ-centric is eccentric. And speaking of the Christian way of being. And so quite often the church has become eccentric because it's focused on things that were never meant to be at the center of its journey. It's like the wheel in a hub, with the hub in a wheel that's not centered. The wheel will move in a strange way. And there's lots of Christians moving in strange ways because Jesus Christ is not at the center of their worship. A good God gaze will fix an awful lot in our journey. I, I find it quite amusing the way we as God's kids like to bask in the reflected glow of God's glory that was intended for him alone. So if a supernatural event happens around us, if a miracle or a deliverance thing happens around us, or we see God do some wonderful things in terms of provision, or our church grows wonderfully, or we have a pastoral moment where someone's life's fixed up, there's something of our broken humanity that seems to enjoy the reflected glow of God's glory. And we tend to have this weird way of making it fix what is internally broken, that, that everyone created in the image of God is orphan-hearted to a degree. We are not orphans, the Bible says we are adopted into the family of God, but we still sometimes operate, operate in an orphan-hearted drivenness to try to please God, to, to be acceptable, that's religion and not the gospel. We, we're, in a, we're in a place where we're trying to um, prove ourselves to the church or to the pastor or to ourselves because our past wasn't that pleasing even to ourselves. But a good God gaze will fix a lot. If we focus on the fact that it's not what we do, but what Christ did. And more than that, the, the window into heaven we just saw um, points to a God that is far beyond our comprehension. And this is where everything starts to become amusing when we start to take the glory that belongs to God alone. Because um, the word holy in that passage, holy, 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 is the Greek word hagios. Now, a lot of people think it means sanctified or set apart. What, what are the living creatures and the elders and everyone agreeing to God being hagios, to being holy? Well, ultimately, if you boil it down, that word literally means different, right at its root word, or beyond. There is a God essence that is so different to what we have on earth, so beyond what we have ever could be by our own strength, so great beyond our comprehension, that we only need a good God gaze for a few moments to be humbled by how great thou art, as the hymn writer said. Then sings my soul. Your soul starts to soar when you look at God. I, I was contemplating for a series I was writing for our church, various hymns, and I, I looked at one by a guy called Harold Heber, which is indeed holy, holy, holy. And as I did, as I did start to look at holy, 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 and started to read about the sea of glass we've just seen, I started to cry. I started to weep with my Bible in my hands. And the more I meditated on the greatness of God, the more I felt inadequate to do God's work for him. In fact, everything that I thought I could do before that meditative moment 
seem to pale next to the greatness of who God is. And it just made me worship and joy. I wasn't in any way feeling rejected by the Lord, but it put me in my place. And sometimes we so need to be put in our place in our emotionality because a good God gaze will fix a lot. Let me go into what I mean by that. I'll show you by using this illustration. This last week, my daughter was contemplating. She's seven years old. She's a beautiful girl. She's uh, one of my three greatest gifts God's given me outside of himself. And she was wandering around in the lounge. She suddenly turned on the heels and came to the kitchen to me and she said, hey, dad, I said, whenever your child engages you, you're like, oh, this is just joy, joy to my soul. We, we waited 11 years for our children, prayed. And God told me one day, he sat me down on this very, very chair. And he said, he said, Steve, sit down like a dad would by his spirit. He said, now ask me for two children. I said, uh, like a child would ask for sweets. I said, Lord, can I have two children, please? 11 years on. And then I saw the process God would take us through and a journey in my mind of how we would end up with two children. And then some different people would come to me. Here I am uh, quoting scripture and the children God has so graciously given us. So I'm, I'm very over the top in the way I love my kids. They, they, if anything, they know that they're loved. Ask Lewis every night, does, do, you know you love, do you know daddy loves you? And, and how much does daddy love you? And he'll joke back and say, too much, you know, too much, daddy. And I say, how can I, I love you too much? Well, Eleanor came over to me once. And so I have this habit, no matter how distracted I am, to turn on my heels too and give her my fullest attention. I have a terrible habit with these. Maybe you do too, mobile phones. And so I put my phone to one side when she speaks to me and I'm on her in that moment. I'm looking at her. He said, dad, is heaven our reward from God? I thought, oh my goodness, what a question from a seven-year-old. I thought, oh Lord, how do I answer this? I've been here before. I was a primary teacher for 10 years. And the best answer I could come up with, I said, oh, yeah, I think it is actually. But I think God's our reward in heaven more than that. And actually, I think heaven is where he is. And if he wasn't there, I'm not sure it would be heaven. She was already lost by the time I started to contemplate God in his ontological state. But the, the reality is she went away excited about heaven. Because she, cause I said to her, it's more wonderful that we, than we can think. It's better than you can know. It's what we were built for. And I said, you know, having a dad as a preacher is a real liability sometimes for kids who have got so many other great things to do with their life. And she walked away as I'm still preaching to myself, probably saying, you know, what the Bible talks in Hebrews about it's, it's our homeland. It's, it's where we'll feel, finally find rest and all, all this business. And uh, she was away. And, but that night, it obviously had an impact on her, that conversation. She got a Bible. She said, Mom, give me my NIV Bible. It's a chunky one. And she started reading the Bible. And that night we found her still sat up at half ten reading the Bible. Now, you can't tell your daughter off for reading the Bible. She was there till half ten. And she was actually up to the giving of the Ten Commandments in, in her Bible. And then the, the next night she was beyond that. And now three nights in, she did it every night. I'll show you the pictures one day. Three, uh, at least show Peter. Three, three nights in, um, she's there on a bed. We've got a beautiful photo of her on her belly, lying prostrate with a Bible in front of her hand. She's now up to the Elisha Elijah narratives like this. This is a this is a child. What's my point in saying all this? This is a child who has been told about the goodness and the greatness of God. And the fact that he's better than you think. And heaven is wonderful. We looked at a window in heaven and it sparked something in a heart to make her go after God with all of her heart. Now, it's a totally unfair question and it's cruel of me to ask it. But when was the last time you or I fell asleep with the Bible in our hands, hungry for God? Hungry for God. Hungry for him, for who he is, not to get a word or to get a preach or to become something. We already are something in Christ, but hungry for God in a childlike simplicity. I want to know this God of heaven who is better than I could think. Daddy told me he's better than I think, and I want him. That's my daughter's mind. And she's going after him, after Jesus. And it reminded me of the story of Moses. Moses in Exodus 33 is in the tent of meeting, which is a remarkable thing. And it says in verse 11 of Exodus 33, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. 
as a man speaks to a friend. Oh my goodness. Now I've heard people say in the new covenant age, we have it better than them because we're one spirit, the Lord, Lord speaks spirit to spirit. Yes, on a, on a level, that's very true. But how many people do you know that have spoken face to face with God with regularity as a man speaks to a friend? And then later on in the passage from verse 11, jump to verse 18 in, of Exodus 33. It says this. Now Moses said, God, show me your glory. Seven verses on from a guy who speaks face to face with God. The people stand at their entrances to their tent, watching the supernatural operation of the cloud of glory that settles on the tent of meeting. They don't go near it, but they know God's in town. And then Moses, seven verses later, is a bit like the Apostle Paul saying, now show me your glory. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ. Uh, what? Paul, Paul you... You've done so much for the Lord. You met him on the Damascus road. It was hard for you to kick against the goads. You stopped resisting the Lord. You turn your life over to him and you turn the world upside down for him. Now you're asking this question that you want to know Christ. It sounds strange. But you know, I think in life as Christian believers, life hits us so hard so many times. And we get so busy and so burdened that we lose the child's childlike delight in our creator. The very reason we were created. Everything was made by God and for God. That window into heaven that we don't understand the living creatures with eyes all around them and the rainbow at the throne and the jasper and the, and the, the figurative imagery of that. We, we know that God is on his throne in front of a glassy sea with thousands worshipping him. And the, the natural thing in heaven, as we have in Isaiah 6, is before God, we say, holy, holy, holy. Because God is present. You know, it's a bit like, it's a terrible illustration, but when you're in a restaurant and you have a meal, when you finish a meal and it was really good, you say, oh, that was delightful. That was lovely. I enjoy it. However you, however you express it, worship is natural response to something you enjoy. Worship, worship, that was worth it. That was worth spending the money. That was worth spending the time. That was worth eating it. It's a normal way. It's how we were created to worship. And when you're in the presence of God, it is inevitable that we will worship the Lord and we will enjoy worshiping him because it's living according to design. John Piper, that great preacher, said in his book, Seeing, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ, nobody goes to the Grand Canyon to be fulfilled in their flesh and to receive some form of self-affirmation in self. No one gets any satisfaction in self. We, we put ourselves, as A.W. Tozer said, on the throne of our heart, replacing God for ourselves, whatever way we do that. And this is what Piper's talking about, that people don't go to the Grand Canyon to get some sort of self-satisfaction in self or what they do. And they go because they're starved of glory. And they go to the Grand Canyon for the wow moment. <gasps> wow. And you and I do that, whether we drive to a hill to look at a view or whether we like taking photographs of birds or whatever it is that f floats our boat in God's creation. The Bible says all of creation displays his glory. The heavens tell about the glory of God. The invisible attributes of God are seen in what is made. And so when we're enjoying something pleasurable in this world, it is a reflection of the greatness and the goodness and the glory of God. And we see him. We see him. It's a bit like in that passage, Exodus 33. God covers Moses with his hand, puts it over the top of him, and he says, Moses, you've asked to see my glory. I'll let all of my goodness, my essence, who I am, pass before you, but I am so great that I'm likely to split you into atoms if you gaze upon me, for no man will see me and live. I am a great God, but I love you so much. I'm going to come past you. I'm going to cover you. You're going to see my back. And you know, in this life, in this glass darkly life sometimes the best we have of seeing God is seeing his back what do I mean by that seeing where he's been seeing him in his creation seeing him in the astrological astronomical astronomical astronomical, 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 astronomical uh, array of stars out there and saying whoa whoa the heavens tell about the glory of God how great thou art father I can't see you 
but having not seen you, I rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of the faith, the salvation of my soul. I am rejoicing in you. So often I pray this prayer in my bedroom. I see you, Father. Of course, I can't see him with my eyes, but I see him by faith. I see him in Revelation 4, and I say things like, I see you on your throne. I see the glass you see. I believe, Father, and therefore I speak. I see those 24 elders worshipping you. It is true, Father. And, I, and, and you bring a positive affirmation. And the longer you gaze upon the goodness and the greatness of God, the glory of God enters your now. If you want to know his presence, focus on Christ on the throne. Focus on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So often we let circumstances and stresses overwhelm us. And whilst I know the body gets tired, Jesus needed to rest, didn't he, in John 4. But still in those moments where we have any energy, we can turn our faces to the Lord and with unveiled faces behold his glory and see, and see him. And in seeing him, we're changed from one degree of glory to the next. Even if it's a brief pause in your day, you can find him again. Let me fix this up with a finished three bullet ending. I said a good God gaze will fix a lot of things. A good God gaze, number one, will make us truly human. What do I mean by that? Well, I think that imbalance has come in to people and often to Christians too, when they put themselves at the center. We were never meant to orb our lives around ourselves and our own life. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And this is, he said, the pagans run after these things. Speaking of what we try to acquire or do or achieve, self-actualization or whatever it is where Christ is not leading us forward. Jesus teaches us that his spirit would lead us. These are the children of God, those who are led by the spirit. So often the church is running after material possessions and the Bible says, be content with such things as you have. So often we take on the traits of the world because we've not got a good God gaze. And instead of putting Jesus at the center, we've put our own self-interest back on. We, Tozer says we, we replace Christ on the throne, Christ that was on the throne of our heart with our own agenda, our own self. But nothing apart from Jesus was made for that throne. So we become truly human. We, we live according to design when Christ is at the center. A good gaze will not only make us truly human, it will also in that respect fix any imbalance. There's loads of imbalances in us because of whatever level of orphan heartedness we operate at, that we are insecure or prideful or whatever the expression of not being able to express the design God put in us. But when we look upon the Lord, the fear of man, the concerns of this world, the insecurity, the pride, the selfishness, it all gets obliterated with a good God gaze. When we look upon Jesus, our imbalances are fixed. We come into order because Steve Brady's right. Anything that's not Christ centric is eccentric. Let's put Christ on the hub of our wheel and we'll move forward in a healthy way. So it not only makes us truly human, it fixes our imbalance towards self-interested living. But it thirdly also brings us satisfaction. A good God gaze will satisfy you more than anything in this world. The reality is Mick Jagger's preaching the truth. We can't get no satisfaction in anything other than Christ. You know, you could be a millionaire and be suicidal at the same time. You've seen it many times in world press, world news. Jesus alone satisfies. He was made for, he, was, he made us for him to sit in intimacy with him. He made us to know him. It's a bit like the imagery of a man and woman coming together as one flesh. The bride of Christ must one day be united with the bridegroom, Jesus. And in, in the preparation for that and the anticipation for that, the bride must rise up and become to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. I often say this phrase so that she might kiss at the altar and be comparable to him. And I think that will only come when the church is absolutely in love with Jesus. Sorry to say this, and I know that many of you are not into Kylie Minogue, but the truth is, Kylie's words, I can't get you out of my head, is where we need to get back to with Jesus. Jesus needs to be the one that we wake up thinking about, not 
the business of our schedule or how much we've got to get done in the day or where we fall short or why we're not a good enough Christian or whether we have enough money for this, that, and the, but Jesus Christ, I, I'm in love with you. I'm in love with you, Lord, because you know as well as I do, there have been seasons in your life, maybe you're still in that season, where you've been like the flurry of young love with Jesus. When, when it's been like that whirlwind romance moment with Jesus, God wants to restore that to his church so the bride would be ready to kiss him at the altar. He alone satisfies. Day and night, the living creatures never stop saying, holy, holy, holy. In the morning, I'll seek you. Late in the night watches, I'll seek you, Lord. I, I believe God wants to stir us to get hungry again. And it's okay tonight when this is over, if you feel anything I've said has touched you, to go to the Lord and say, I'm tired, Lord. I've lost my hunger for you, Lord. I, I'm, I don't feel intimate with you, Lord. I, whatever it is that's personal to you, but just start, start the journey back. It's a bit like the book of Hosea where he says, return to me with words. You see, see, see words start a journey back in relationship, don't they? You know when you've fallen out with someone and then you, you skulk back into the presence of them and say, I, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Return to me with words. And God will put his arms around you because he loves you so much. I, I think that we need to take on Heber's words from that hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. When, when you wake up in the morning, let Christ be your first love. Let Christ be your first love. Become a God gazer again. Become fascinated with Jesus again. And you know what? Everything that you do will come into order. Let me finish with one scripture and then a short reading of a poem. That scripture that says, um, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It, I, I, Peter, it's scary actually saying this because Peter's a Hebrew scholar, but I believe it says he shall keep you in shalom, shalom, whose creative imagination is founded in Yahweh. Well, it's a bit of a mix of translation that, isn't it? But shalom is, and Peter would be able to expand on this, this sense of wholeness, health, wealth, prosperity, well-being, peace, yes. But the sense of coming together in order where Christ is back on the throne of our hearts with the hub at the center of the wheel. He will keep you in shalom, shalom. That's like emboldened, italicized writing. He'll keep you in that perfect peace, that perfect wholeness. When? When will he do that? When our creative imagination is founded in Yah. When all that we are is centered around him again then things come into order a good god gaze will fix a lot may we be god gazing people let me read you a, a very short part of a poem by someone who peter davis massively Im impacted in his bible college years and he's now leading a very large church and having a big impact because of peter's teaching on amos malcolm duncan wrote this i want to be a god gazer Captured by the brilliance that springs from the radiance of you. I want to be a God gazer, not a cheap food grazer or an easy option laser. I want to be a trailblazer for the ordinary everyday life. I want to be a God gazer, not just copying the halcyon ways that shimmer brighter in the haze of bygone rays and the good old days. I want to be a God gazer, looking beyond the trappings of success, cutting through the stucco of respectability like a laser piercing darkness. I want to be a God gazer, reaching for the stars and seeing beauty in the moment by becoming fluent in the language of the God who is here, who is now. I want to be a God gazer until my imagination is saturated, until my thirst is sated, until my passion is stirred, until my intellect is stretched, as far as it can be, until my yearning yearns for others to be free. I want to be a God gazer, not a meetings manager, or a people pleaser, or a tea and sympathy vicar, not a leadership trainer, not just a speaker, but a seeker. I want to be a God gazer. And for the moment, I want God to gaze through me. I want others to see his eyes, his heart, his mind and love. Above everything else in me, I want to be a God gazer, captured by the brilliance that springs from the radiance of you. Amen. You know, as we come to our communion time now, the cross makes a way for a good God gaze. You can have access to the most holy place by a new and living way. 
unveiled faces that behold his glory. That is such a privilege. Moses would have been split to atoms, but through the blood of Jesus, we can draw near. Hebrews 4.16 says that we should approach the throne of grace with boldness, that we might receive grace and help in a time of need. This is certainly a time of need now. And we can approach boldly because of the blood of Jesus and the finished work of the cross. It's a new age, a new covenant, new agreement in the Son's blood. But think of the privilege of God gazing and how it was wrought through the blood of Jesus. In Galatians 3, it talks about that, that the Spirit of God comes on the lives of believers because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And a good God gaze is only possible because of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us and making a way where there was no way. Amen. I'd like to thank Pastor Steve for that very encouraging uh, and uh, challenging word to us. And at the end of uh, his talk, Pastor Steve was mentioning a poem uh, by Malcolm Duncan. It's actually quite a long poem, and he just read the first section about being a God gazer. And so I'd just like to read those words and have them on screen for us to follow so that that can be our prayer too, that we will indeed be God gazers. I want to be a God gazer, captured by the brilliance that springs from the radiance of you. I want to be a God gazer, not a cheap food grazer or an easy option laser. I want to be a trailblazer for the ordinary everyday life. I want to be a God gazer, not just copying the halcyon ways that shimmer brighter in the haze of bygone rays and the good old days. I want to be a God gazer, looking beyond the trappings of success, cutting through the stucker of respectability like a laser piercing darkness. I want to be a God gazer, reaching for the stars and seeing beauty in the moment by becoming fluent in the language of the God who is here, who is now. I want to be a God gazer until my imagination is saturated, until my thirst is sated, until my passion is stirred, until my intellect is stretched as far as it can be, until my yearning yearns for others to be free. I want to be a God gazer, not a meetings manager or a people pleaser or a tea and sympathy vicar, not a leadership trainer, not just a speaker but a seeker. I want to be a God gazer. And for a moment, I want God to gaze through me. I want others to see his eyes, heart, mind, and love above everything else in me. I want to be a God gazer, captured by the brilliance that springs from the radiance of you. What a wonderful poem, what wonderful aspirations. And I hope that that encourages us to seek after God. And really there is no better time to do that than right now, as we come and as we take communion, as we take these emblems that uh, remind us of Jesus' body broken for us, of his blood shed for us, as we gaze on the cross and we see there on the cross, this most perfect, most magnificent example of God's love and also amazingly his power in action as our sin is being forgiven. So I invite you now to take these emblems uh, and as we do we will listen to uh, Alice sing so beautifully this song that is written by Chad. It's called communion song because that is what we're doing not just taking bread and drinking wine but instead we are having communion, we are having fellowship, we're able to gaze at our God.
let's just take a few more minutes just contemplating what God has done for us, what God is doing for us and what God will do for us. And then in just a few moments, we will close this service with Alex singing another beautiful song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. <laughs>